As uh, Paul said, tonight's subject is the dino bird controversy, and my title is Did Birds Evolve from Dinosaurs? And what we're going to do this evening is look at the actual evidence for the, uh, the, the statement that many people make, that the media will make, and many evolutionary scientists will make, that we have good evidence that birds evolved from dinosaurs. So we're going to look at that evidence. We're going to start looking at theropod dinosaurs. The supposed ancestors of birds are the theropod dinosaurs, so you're going to get a bit of a quick lesson in dinosaur nomenclature and some badly pronounced dinosaur names in very bad Latin, and I struggle very much with the, with the names, but uh, hopefully it won't be too confusing. We're going to look at some of the fossils that really have sparked the recent debate in whether we can actually claim, or some people can claim, that uh, birds evolved from dinosaurs. But we're also going to look at the design of birds and see whether the evolutionary explanation is adequate to explain what we actually observe in birds today. And we're going to look particularly at feathers, and we're going to look at how the lungs of birds operate. So, theropod dinosaurs. What are theropod dinosaurs? Well, here is a picture of a theropod dinosaur, uh, Tyrannosaurus rex. A theropod dinosaur is basically any dinosaur that walks around on two legs. So it can be as big as Tyrannosaurus rex, seven tons of uh, angry meat, or it can be as small as a chicken. As some, some dinosaurs, actually the average size of dinosaurs is actually quite small and not as big as people uh, often assume. So what do the... How can we classify dinosaurs? Well, there, there are two main groups of dinosaurs. There's the Ornithischia. And if you're an ornithologist, you will know that Ornithischia, orny, is bird. Well, actually, the birds didn't descend from these ones, even for an evolutionist. They just happen to have hips that look like bird hips, but they're not at all like birds. And then there are the, the Saurischia, Saurischia, lizard-like hips. So you've got dinosaurs with bird-like hips and dinosaurs with lizard-like hips. And in the, in the second group, we have the theropods, two-legged dinosaurs, and the sauropods. The sauropods are the large four-legged dinosaurs. We've got Tyrannosaurus and the Celurosaurs under the, th the theropod group, and you have things like the Brachiosaurs, which are the large um, Apatosaurus, these sort of really huge uh, dinosaurs. There's one in, um, in the British, the Natural History Museum in London. But the dinosaurs that interest are, us are the group under the Celurosaurs. And you've got th animals like the Velociraptor, which was made famous by a certain Hollywood movie I won't mention. You've got the Nonicus. You've got the uh, animals called uh, Sinosauroteryx. And if you're a, an expert in Latin, you will know that means Chinese lizard wing. And then you've got the Sinornithosaurus, which means Chinese bird lizard. So these names are actually tell you quite a bit about the creature already. And this is a group which are also uh, grouped together and called dromaeosaurs, or raptors. Raptors being much easier to say, named after the velociraptor. So here's a picture of velociraptor. And the, the, one of the interesting characteristics of these creatures, and these reconstructions actually uh, are rather debatable, but the important thing here is the large claw, which I've circled here, and that's the characteristic of this group, the large claw, which people think was used to attack and kill its prey, or maybe enable it to climb trees. The velociraptor is a, a classic uh, dromaeosaur or raptor. And then we have a creature which was quite important in the story of bird evolution, Denonychus. Denonychus has uh, been reconstructed in various ways. Here's a, a fairly old picture of Denonychus, and here is a modern picture of Denonychus, and you will notice it suddenly sprouted feathers. So the modern theory of evolution for, for birds is that uh, these creatures were actually feathered, although they aren't birds. And uh, when this, this creature was dis first discovered in the 1970s, a gentleman called Ostrom described various similarities between Archaeopteryx which is uh, one of the earliest fossil birds discovered in the 1800s, and Denonychus, and concluded they might well be related. And people now believe that they are feathered and bore feathers. But the real interest came, the real excitement in the story of, uh, of bird evolution started when the, they started digging up fossils in China and digging up various 
small dinosaurs of this same group, the raptor group. And here is one called Sinosauroteryx. And it has on its body, you can see the reconstruction here, has on its body what looks like fur, but really are more accurately described as filaments. Uh, some people call them dino fuzz, uh, or if you want to give it the scientific term, uh, proto feathers, or this is what we're told. We've been told that these creatures, uh, I don't think I want to swap just now, this seems to be functioning. So uh, these creatures uh, had this, this, these proto feathers, we're told, and people are telling us today that this is proof that these animals developed feathers as they evolved and eventually turned into birds. Another one is Cordyteryx, which basically means tail feather, because it has quite a nice spray of feathers on its tail. The fossil, you can look at the fossil, and it does look uh, fairly convincing. There are feathers on this creature, and it seemed to have feathers too on its hands or its wings, and about turkey size, this gentleman. But some people say, some evolutionists actually say, well, these, this is no more than just a bird. And there's a fair amount of debate about whether it's a bird or a dinosaur, or how to clarify the two terms. But uh, we're going to come back to that at the end, where I'm going to give you my view on whether they're birds or dinosaurs or something else. Another one well, of the Chinese fossils that's very important in this debate is Sinornithosaurus, uh, similar in size to Sinornithosaurus, and it too uh, appears to have the remains of proto feathers. You can see various bits of fuzz around the, some, some of the bones here of this creature, and, and some evolutionists tell us that these are, these are proto feathers. They're not quite feathers, but they're going to develop into feathers, and it's a stage in the evolution of feathers. The next one <coughs> I want to mention is Microraptor gui, which probably isn't pronounced like that. Those who are Chinese experts can tell me, because some of these names are Chinese, not Latin, so I've got no hope here. Uh, this is very interesting because uh, it appears to have feathers on all four limbs. A four-winged dinosaur. And here's a reconstruction of it, uh, as it might possibly have flown through the sky. The interesting thing about this creature is it would be rather awkward for it to get off the ground once it landed with the feathers on its feet as well as on its hands. Um, what does it stand on? Well, there are various theories about that. But it certainly did generate a lot of interest when this was published in Nature a couple of years back. And then we have a creature that's been named Protarchaeopteryx, and it too is a bit like a turkey, or a, a small ostrich, if you like, running on the ground, but it had uh, feathers on it, in its tail and on its hands or arms. And these were quite long, and it uh, is possibly, well, it's been claimed to be one of the ancestors of birds, or an example of how birds could have evolved from dinosaurs. And here we have Archaeopteryx. Can't uh, have, a, have a talk on bird evolution without Archaeopteryx. Here's uh, one of the, the well-known uh, slabs of uh, rock from Germany where you, you find most of the specimens of Archaeopteryx. And here's a reconstruction of Archaeopteryx uh, drawn quite... Uh, quite a good, it's just quite a good reconstruction. It makes it look like a bird, which I would approve of because I believe that it is a bird. It's got some interesting features. We're going to come back to that. And we're going to look at Archaeopteryx in more detail and, and, and try to come to some conclusion about what it really means. The next fossil isn't actually a fossil at all, it's actually bird-like footprints. This was published in Nature in June 2002, and here's a picture of these, these footprints in rock which people dug up in um, Argentina. I'm reported, as I said, in Nature. This picture is taken from Nature. And if you're a, not an expert, you'll look at these, and I would hope you'd agree with me. They look pretty much like bird footprints you'd get on the beach any day of the week if you went down to uh, the beach not far from here. And uh, this is what the authors say. They look like bird footprints. Uh, they've got four toes, and they've actually got a reverse a, a toe that seems to be going backwards, just like a, a, a perching bird would have. Perching birds with a backward-facing toe. And the authors, when describing these footprints, they have great trouble because they look like bird footprints. They have all the characteristics of bird footprints. The trouble is they're too old. These things, are, these things are Triassic. And if you're an expert in, uh, in dinosaurs, you know that dinosaurs didn't exist during the Triassic, let alone birds. Uh, the earliest bird, if you're following an evolutionary time scale, is Jurassic. So what can these things be? So the authors basically hum and ha, and they say, well, they've, they've clearly looked like bird footprints, but they can't be bird footprints because we know birds hadn't evolved. And what's more, they don't have any possible dinosaur that could have made these footprints. So they're a bit of a loss to explain what they are. Whereas if you're a simple character like me, you might conclude they were bird footprints. 
So let's just look at this, how things uh, stand at the moment. Oh, no, not quite there yet. One more, sorry. Proto-Avis, before we look at how things stand. Proto-Avis, or Proto-Avis, Proto-Avis, a uh, prototype bird, is older than Archaeopteryx if you're on an evolutionary time scale. Yet it has actually lots of advanced features. It's a lightly built pneumatized skull. And basically the skull's got air spaces in it, which makes it light, which is what you expect for a bird. Its brain architecture appears to be like a bird. You can actually look at the remains of the skull and work out which bits of the brain are highly developed and which aren't. And that's characteristic of birds. And we're going to talk more about bird brains later. And it has asymmetric flight feathers, which is a characteristic of a bird that flies. They're asymmetric feathers. And we're going to look at feathers, as I said, a bit later. And it also has a keel-like sternum, and therefore we conclude it's probably a strong flyer. Birds with a large keel-like sternum have large muscle bulk attached to that, and so they can fly. But this is actually very controversial. This bird has been pieced together uh, by a gentleman called uh, Chatterjee, who's, I believe, uh, working in America. And he found various fragments, and he put all these fragments together and said, well, here we have what looks like a bird. Uh, the trouble is, uh, it's a little too old. And this is where my next slide comes in, because you can put all these fossils in a sequence. And here, let's, just, let's, for the sake of argument, take the evolutionary time scale. So we're talking about a period of about 200 million years ago up to 70 million years ago, approximately the, the age of the dinosaurs, although the dinosaurs really didn't come in until a bit later, about midway through there. So where do the fossils come in the sequence? The first thing we have, actually the first thing we have, is, the, is proto avis which is older than these Triassic footprints. Well, I haven't put it on there because it's a bit controversial. But these footprints are the oldest things we find. Then you find Archaeopteryx. Comes next about 150 million years. And after that, you have these various Chinese fossils, uh, which are about 120 million years old, according to the evolutionary time scale, and which include uh, Donenicus. And Velociraptor is actually very young, at 70 million years old according to the evolutionist. So here we have told, here we have what, uh, creatures which are supposed to explain the evolution of birds from dinosaurs and they all happen to be younger than the dinosaurs, the, the birds themselves. So how could your ancestors be younger than you are? It's usually your descendants. So if anything, the argument should be these creatures, these Chinese fossils have descended from the birds because the birds were around before then. Uh, especially if you accept that these footprints are bird footprints. So if you're an evolutionist, you have a bit of a problem because it seems the birds came from nowhere and possibly devolved into these theropod dinosaurs. So the first, the first point I really want to make here is that the, fossil, the order of the fossils doesn't actually help. And worse still, what the evolutionists will say is, OK, we have the ancestor somewhere else, we just haven't found it yet. So OK, where's your evidence for a common ancestor between the theropods and the birds? Well, we haven't got it. But we believe it's there and we're going to find it. Well, that requires faith. <clears throat> okay, let's talk a bit more about Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx, just to remove any shadow of a doubt, is a bird. And just about everybody accepts that it's a bird. It has more than 20 features shared with birds. It has a skeleton designed for flapping flight. Uh, this is not a skeleton of Archaeopteryx, by the way. This is a pigeon. But it shows you some of the features uh, which give you... Uh, ability to fly. Now Archaeopteryx doesn't have all the features of the modern bird, but it has many features of the bird. It has air-filled bones. All birds have bones with air spaces inside them rather than fluid spaces, and that's an important part of making them very light and also part of their uh, breathing system. And we'll talk more about that later. The feathers of Archaeopteryx that have been found are asymmetric, and asymmetric feathers are flight feathers, and I'll show you some pictures of those. In fact, I'll show you a picture straight away. Here is an asymmetric flight feather. Because when I say asymmetric, it's because it's got the rachis not in the middle but over to one side. And as I said, we're going to look a bit more at the way feathers are constructed. And Archaeopteryx also has a brain like a bird. And Archaeopteryx, everybody concludes, was, was a bird. It was a rather strange bird, but it was a bird. I just want to briefly talk about the Munich specimen, which is one of the more recent specimens of Archaeopteryx. Previously known as the uh, Solhofen Acton Viren specimen, excuse my German. <coughs> well, that's why I call it the Munich specimen, it's easier, by a gentleman called uh, Wellenhofer. And he actually classifies a new species, Archaeopteryx uh, bavarica. And the interesting thing about this 
specimen is it actually has a small sternum. Previously, all the specimens of Archaeopteryx we had didn't seem to have a sternum. And if you know anything about birds, birds have to have a sternum to attach the flight muscles to. It's the, it's the, uh, the keel you find on your chicken when you carve the breast off the chicken. You have this bit of bone that sticks up. That's a, a keel-like sternum. We have a flat sternum because you don't have so many muscles to attach to it. But birds, flying birds especially, have a keel-like sternum. And Archaeopteryx, this specimen of Archaeopteryx, appears to have quite a, a clear sternum. Not as big as some strong flyers, but it does seem to have one. So again, reinforcing the belief that Archaeopteryx is a bird and not a dinosaur. Let's think about the Archaeopteryx brain. You can actually look at the brain of Archaeopteryx from some of the fossils and work out the architecture of the brain and the way the brain is constructed and the bits of the brain that are well developed determines the kind of behaviour you can uh, adopt. So what people have done, and this is published in Nature in 2004 by a gentleman called Alonso and his uh, co collaborators. And here are the pictures from Nature of the endocast of the brain, what the brain of the Archaeopteryx would look like. And what it's got is a brain that resembles modern birds meaning that there's a dominance of the sense of vision, so the visual cortex is very large, and it's got expanded auditory and spatial sensory perception systems, uh, not only in its brain but also in its inner ear, which allows it to navigate in three dimensions like a bird would have to. It also has a highly developed uh, cerebellum, which allows for a very fine motor control. So, again, more evidence reinforcing the belief that Archaeopteryx is a bird. <clears throat> but Archaeopteryx also has uh, pneumatic foramen, and I'll explain what that means. Basically, birds have a system of, uh, of hollow bones, and they have tubes connecting the lungs and what's called air sacs to the bones, and the air doesn't just go into the lungs of the bird, it goes into the bones, it goes into the air sacs, it goes many different places, all part of the system of keeping the bird light and also uh, for uh, allowing it to breathe in a special way. And up, up until recently, up until about, well, not recently, 1998, people weren't too sure whether Archaeopteryx had pneumatic foramen because it wasn't very easy to see them. But somebody did some analysis of one of the fossils and they found various indications of large uh, holes in the, the bones of the Archaeopteryx which allowed uh, for air to pass into the bones. And there's a diagram on your um, right-hand side and the picture on the left. And I've given you the circle there to show you where this uh, pneumatic foramen is. This is part of the skeleton in the chest region of the bird. And also we have a picture from, again from the same article in Nature, of the neck region of the bird. And there are four pneumatic foramen, basically holes for air to go through, on the, on the neck bones of the bird. And this is, of Archaeopteryx, this is characteristic of modern birds as well. So we can be pretty certain that Archaeopteryx had air-filled bones like modern birds with air sacs with passages going into the bones. So basically we can conclude that uh, Archaeopteryx was designed to fly. It had feathers, it had asymmetric flight feathers. It, had, it appears to have this sophisticated respiratory system connected to air sacs. It has a skeleton designed for powered flight with the right articulation so that it could flap its wings although uh, it's, it wouldn't have been a very strong flyer because it didn't have a very large sternum. It has the, uh, the light uh, weight air-filled bones, similar to modern birds today. And it had a brain with an enlarged cerebellum and visual cortex, which was a brain designed to allow it to uh, fly around, basically the avionics it needs to fly around. But let's talk more about air sacs, because if you are uh, aware of what's in the literature, you will know that not, it's not only birds that have air sacs. But, so we need to think about air sacs and look at some of the other evidence as well. So here's a diagram of a bird, the various air sacs labelled there for you, and the lung in the middle, sort of the grey blob in the middle is the lung, and the air sacs all around the young lung and various uh, tubes connecting the various air sacs. So the breathing system of a bird is extremely unusual amongst living creatures on Earth today. It's unidirectional and it has continuous flow through the lung, unlike ourselves. So you have not only do you have lungs, you have air sacs and you have the air-filled bones, which are all part of the respiratory system, the gas exchange system of a bird. And this allows it to have a very efficient system 
for extracting oxygen from the air and getting rid of carbon dioxide. And birds, being very active, very metabolically active, have to get rid of the carbon dioxide very quickly and have to absorb oxygen very rapidly. And how does this system work? Well, basically, when a bird breathes in, the air doesn't go into its lungs. It goes into the rear air sacs, the abdominal air sac here, and the, other, the posterior thoracic sac as well. So the, the first breath in, the air goes into the back of the bird, not into the lung. Then the bird starts to breathe out, and the air goes into the lung, and then carries on through to the forward air sacs. And while this is happening, uh, more air is also coming in, straight through the, the tube that goes through the lung, not through the lung, but straight into the back again. So what you have is a continuous flow-through system. And when the bird finally breathes out, it breathes out first to the uh, front air sacs, then out. And it's rather difficult to show in a diagram, but uh, people have done experiments with uh, radioactive air and watched it go through the various passages. And what, what you actually have is you have one-way flow through the lung going out rather than in, which allows the bird to continuously breathe. The bird doesn't stop breathing. We breathe in. There's a pause and we breathe out. Birds don't do that. <clears throat> and the evidence from the fossils that birds have air sacs is usually that they have these... Um, pneumatic foramen because you don't often find remains of air sacs being soft tissues they don't fossilize very well but they have found these pneumatic foramen even in the sauropod dinosaurs which is quite interesting so dinosaurs also have hollow air filled bones or had hollow air filled bones and some of the raptors definitely had air filled bones but so did uh, creatures like the tyrannosaurus and the pterosaurs which are the flying reptiles, or flying dinosaurs, and the sauropods, very large, four-legged uh, dinosaurs. Now, the, the, uh, the pterodactyls, or pterosaurs, and the sauropods have absolutely nothing to do with birds. No evolution is going to make a claim that they're related, but they still have air sacs. So the question uh, comes to mind is what they're doing there. But before we get to that, here's a diagram again from Nature, showing um, air sac, uh, the, uh, pneumatic foramen in uh, a raptor, an unnamed raptor, just has a number, not very interesting. And here you have the large opening, very clearly shown, in the, in the fossil bone, where the air can go through. And this can be compared with a nutrient foramen, which is where the blood vessels go through, which carry the blood, which carry the nutrients to the bone to keep the bone alive. So if your, if your fossil has very large openings like this, you can assume that they are for airways, airways to let the air into the bone. Now, the sauropods, as I said, are known to have air sacs, and I find this rather interesting diagram uh, on the internet, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, basically, why do they have air sacs for weight reduction? If you're a massive, great dinosaur, uh, 30 metres long, you're quite heavy. Having air sacs could actually help you and actually help you float. So the idea is that these, some of these creatures would actually spend a lot of time in water, and these are buoyancy aids, you know, water wings for sauropods, internal. So the sauropod would actually float through the water because of the air sacs rather than sink. So this is not completely uh, off the wall. People have seriously suggested this as, as a reason why the very large sauropods had air sacs. And of course, things like pterosaurs would have had air sacs because they need to fly and they would be lightweight. But the question is, if you have air sacs, does that mean that you've got a respiratory system like a bird? Or does that mean you're evolving a respiratory system like a bird? Now, the evolutionists would like to claim, yes, if you've got air sacs, maybe you've got a system which is on the way to evolving into a bird. And one piece of evidence that's put forward is this gentleman called, um, I suspect, Marjong Gath Gathalus, or Marjong Gathalus, Atopus. Anybody got any suggestions on how it's pronounced? Please help me out. Uh, I hate these names. That's why I didn't become a, a paleontologist, too much Latin. And it was a medium-sized theropod dinosaur. So in the same family that people think uh, became birds, but a bit large, medium sized being only weighed about a ton. So rather than a Tyrannosaurus rex, seven tons. And here's a picture of it from uh, Creative Commons. And it had a, but the interesting thing about this is that it had an avian or a bird like respiratory system. Uh, because the, this, this specimen that they found recently, again, the work was published in Nature in uh, 2005. This specimen they found recently has got evidence of actually some of the air sacs were preserved. And uh, when, they did, when they examined the specimen, they found it had an avian aspiration pump system, in other words, the flow-through, one-way flow-through system. 
ventilation of the lung <clears throat> during both inspiration and expiration, which is what a bird does. Air goes through the lung uh, while it's breathing in and out, but one way. So it has a design which is uh, optimised for efficient gas exchange, just like the birds. So the evolutionists might come to you and say, well, here we have proof of an animal on the way to becoming a bird, but it can't be because it's too big, and it hasn't got the other bird features anyway. But it proves that you can evolve from a lung to a, a bird-like uh, respiratory system. Well, it doesn't, actually, because this system is complete, so it, it doesn't actually help you at all. Here's a diagram, again, from Nature, where they reconstruct the um, system. You've got, uh, here you've got the uh, cervical uh, system of air sacs. Here you have the lung in the middle in orange and uh, uh, the abdominal system of air sacs at the back in blue, which they've reconstructed more or less from the evidence that they've dug up. And the various bones down the bottom here are showing you the, the pneumatic foramen. So they've got these large holes, which is much larger than you need for blood vessels, to allow the air to go through the bones. So it had the, the lightweight uh, bones. But the, the thing to remember here is that this doesn't, isn't actually a, a step on the way to having a bird-like lung system. It is a bird-like lung system. So they, the authors conclude that theropods had a bird-like th flow-through breathing system. But the problem of how you actually evolve from a, a sac-like lung that we have, or other mammals have, or other, other creatures have that aren't birds, to a flow-through lung remains unsolved. They haven't got any steps along the way. It's a complete system. And let's just think about the lung a bit compared with the, the, the lung of, of something like a mammal or a bird. Birds have a one-way continuous flow tubular system, and here's a diagram again, another diagram of what a bird lung would look like where you've got the uh, air sacs at the front and the back. You've got the lungs in the middle looking a bit like a radiator because what you have is tubes that go through. Then the air is conducted through these lots of little tubes. And as they go through the tubes, uh, oxygen is extracted and carbon dioxide is given up from the blood. Whereas we have a lung, which is basically a sac. And it's a bellows system, tidal flow. You breathe in, the air goes into the, into the lungs. You breathe out, the air goes out of the lungs. And it's discontinuous, and it goes backwards and forwards, whereas the bird is continuous and the flow is always one way. But it's more complicated than just the, the, the bit of plumbing that I showed you, because if you look at the, what the lung is like on a microscopic scale, you've got alveoli, which are again small sacs right on the end of small tubes, and these alveoli are surrounded by blood vessels, and that's where the gas exchange takes place. Whereas a bird has parabronchi, and parabronchi are essentially tubes, where the air goes through, where the blue arrows are going down through there, and as they go through, the blood vessels on either side of the tube, which are extracting the oxygen and giving up carbon dioxide. So the whole thing is, is much more complicated than just making a hole in your lungs and having a sac at the back. You've got to actually redesign the whole system, and there's no good evolutionary explanation for how you could do that uh, from a gradual Darwinian point of view. So there's still the problem for the evolutionists to explain how the bird lung system actually arose. They haven't got any fossil evidence that it could happen, and they haven't even got a good scenario for how you could do it, despite the claims of some evolutionists. So let's think about feathers. Feathers, of course, are a feature we all associate with birds. Today, if you go outside, you find a creature with feathers, you know it's a bird. Whether even it's a penguin swimming in the sea, an ostrich running in the desert, or something flying through the air with feathers, you know it's a bird. Uh, of course, you've got other things flying through the air that aren't birds, but they haven't got feathers. So for us, a feather means bird. But does it mean bird? Did it always mean bird when you found a creature with feathers? This is a diagram of some feathers. The, the large one there is a flight feather. The other uh, feathers are secondary feathers and downy feathers, which also have function for uh, insulation, heat insulation. And here is uh, the, the, the key feature of a feather is the rachis, the stalk down the middle called the rachis, and then you've got the barbs at the side. And here is a picture which you've seen before of Archaeopteryx, uh, feather, and the rachis is down the middle here. So it's off-center, it's asymmetric. An asymmetric feather means flight feather. All flight feathers are asymmetric. Birds that don't fly have symmetrical feathers. So we know Archaeopteryx flew because it had symmetric, uh, asymmetric flight feathers. <clears throat> but the feather is not just a stalk with a few filaments coming off the side. It's much more complicated than that. If you look at detail of the barb, you have barbules. And here we have a diagram showing you the two different types of barbules that you get. You get the sliders and you get the hooks. The hooks hook onto the sliders and you end up with a construct like this. 
The purple here is the barbs, barbule, the barb, sorry, and the green barbule sliders and the blue barbule hooks. And they hook onto each other and they slide over each other and they move and they're flexible. But all the time, if you've played with a feather, you will notice that they, they, they stay together, a bit like Velcro, and you get a nice smooth surface and that's essential for getting an aerofoil for flying. So feathers are not just frayed scales. You can't just take a scale and fray it a bit and turn it into a feather. It doesn't work. So they're very complicated structures. And where do they come from? Well, we don't know. But some evolutionists have claimed that these dinosaurs, these small uh, theropod dinosaurs from China, had proto feathers. This is your dino fuzz, or downy proto feathers, claimed to be evidence for evolution of feathers. They're saying these birds, these creatures, sorry, are on the way to becoming birds with feathers. <coughs> and these thing, these, this fuzz that we we detected on a fossil is. Um, a feather in the making. Well, even evolutionists don't agree with that. And there's been a lot of work done, a lot of sort of debate. And what you find in mo many fossils, and fossils that are preserved in the right conditions, because normally the, the skin doesn't preserve, and collagen, uh, collagen is a, a fib collagen fiber is in your skin. And various different fossils, dinosaurs have these collagen fibers. And what the, some people are saying and I would tend to agree with them, is that some of the, 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 the creatures that come from China have these collagen fibres and not feathers at all. And indeed, some pterosaurs look furry, and they've got basically fibres, which are just unbranched fibres, which are more sort of hair-like, but they're not hair, because the biology of their formation is different. So you do get dinosaurs that appear to have some sort of uh, fur or hair-like structure. But let's look at a bit more detail uh, at the... Sinosauroteryx protofeathers, because the structures here I'm talking about, just talked about, are not like feathers at all. <clears throat> and uh, a gentleman, oh, I'm not even sure it's a gentleman actually, uh, somebody called Lingham Soliar has published quite a lot of work in the, the proceedings of the Royal Society of London last year, in March and in September, looking at uh, fossils and the, this, this protofeather, these filament like structures, and comparing them with modern shark skin as it decays. And what they've concluded is, actually, the protofeathers are the remains of structural fibres that strengthen the skin, the collagen fibres that strengthen the skin. And it's the random orientation of the fibres, and which is often caused by breakages as they decompose, gives you some sort of regular pattern in the collagen fibres. And this regular pattern of fibres actually doesn't sh shows not that they've got feathers, but it shows that they've got a frill of skin along the neck and on the back and on the tail. And when this frill of skin starts to decompose and is fossilised, what you're finding is it, it looks like uh, uh, feathers, or uh, well not really, it looks more like, it looks like fibres, which people are saying are becoming feathers. They don't actually look like feathers. So we have a lot of debate about how... Um, whether these are feathers or not, or proto feathers, or something on the way to feathers. But the evidence seems to be saying that, in fact, no, it's collagen fibers are breaking down and decomposing. And as, uh, in September of last year, the same people published some work on this uh, dinosaur, Cetacosaurus, or Cetacosaurus being a, a, a parrot like dinosaur. It wasn't all like a parrot, but that's what the word means. It's actually quite large. And uh, it had. This fossil was unique in that the skin was preserved. It was very thick-skinned and well-preserved. And it had multiple layers, up to 25 layers of fibres of collagen. Uh, they assumed, by looking at it, they looked at this skin, and they said, well, there's no reason to suppose that the skins of, skin of a theropod dinosaur, although it would have less layers because it's not as thick, would have the same structure. And the preservation would give what has been called dino fuzz or the proto feathers and these is what this is what they're saying they're saying it's actually not feathers in the making it's nothing more than rotten skin fossilized so the whole story of the proto feathers the dino fuzz actually doesn't hold up when you examine it in detail there's no evidence here that you've, you're evolving into feathers what it looks like is just rotting skin okay let's go back to the feathers again because some of the dromaeosaurs, some of the raptors, apparently had feathers. And there's very good evidence for it. This one is, didn't even get a name. It's uh, BPM 1313. And it's a raptor similar to Vel uh, Velociraptor or Delonychus. And 
there's well-preserved feathers in these fossils, and this is published uh, recently in um, Nature, 2002. Not that recent. And here's a picture of the fossil, and what we're interested in is what's in the red square, and here's a, a, an enlargement of what's in the red square, red square, and it looks like a feather. In fact, there's the rachis, and here are some of the filaments uh, of the feather, the barbs of the feather. And I don't have any problem with that. It looks like a feather. So here we have uh, what is a raptor or dromaeosaur, and it appears to have feathers. And even more recently, September 2007, people have started to say that a velociraptor had feathers, and here we have some good evidence. How do they know? They didn't find a fossil, a fossil with feathers, but they found something else instead. Birds, some birds, not all birds, have what are called quill knobs, which are on the bone. You can see the picture here. This is actually a turkey vulture, a modern bird. And on the top picture, you see a bit of bone. You've got knobs sticking out along the top. And below, you see where the feathers are attached to these quill knobs. And these are basically the attachment points for secondary flight feathers. And they're anchor points for the ligaments that attach the feathers to the wing. And here's a, a close-up diagram with one of the feathers removed on the right-hand side. That's just so you can see the, the quill knob and then the quills coming down to the rest of the bone. So this is a feature of some birds, not all birds. And what's the, 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 the interesting thing here is that uh, somebody has discovered what they think is a forearm of Velociraptor. Now, I'm not at all sure whether you can be 100% certain it's a forearm of Velociraptor. How do they know it's a forearm of Velociraptor if it's just a bit of bone lying around in Mongolia? But let's assume for the sake of argument that it is a Velociraptor forearm, and it's got quill knobs on it as well. And down below, you've got the enlargement of a small area showing uh, half a dozen quill knobs. So if they're there, the, the, the argument goes that Velociraptor probably ha almost definitely had feathers. The interesting thing is Velociraptor is quite a large creature, a couple of meters long. Uh, and these quill knobs are a characteristic of birds that are strong flyers. So I'm a little uncertain what to make of this piece of evidence. And I'm not really aware of anybody has got, got any clear idea what this means, apart from that they, they had feathers. But uh, if, if it had feathers, and if the quill knobs are a feature of strong flying birds, Velociraptor is rather large to be a strong flyer. Uh, it's interesting. But let's, uh, let's go with the fact that per perhaps Velociraptor did have feathers. <clears throat> so the picture is quite complicated, as you will see. Let's just uh, look at one, one of the Chinese fossils called Eteryx. Now, there's a bit of debate about this bird because some people, this bird, this dinosaur, this bird, because some people say it is a bird. And there's been some publication again in Nature 2000 where the authors of this paper show that the Cordoteryx has many features of running birds, flightless birds that run. <clears throat> the leg proportions are the same as running birds. And it's got an anterior centre of mass. In other words, the centre of mass is towards the front, which is what you need if you're going to run because you lean forward and you run. Just like a, so it disappears like a running bird. It has a short tail, much shorter than any dinosaur. And the, the, the arrangement of the muscles uh, is actually similar to running birds. And here we have a diagram of Cordyteryx below and Deinonychus above, uh, showing the differences. And this evidence seems to suggest that Cordyteryx was a flightless bird. Not certain, not 100% sure, but it seems quite probable that it would, be, would have been a running bird. So, I've thrown a lot of uh, different bits of information at you. Uh, how can we make some sense out of this? Well, here is how I try to make some sense out of it. Trying to decide whether we've got dinosaurs or birds. <clears throat> well, dinosaur side, we've got things like uh, Deinonychus and uh, Sinosauroteryx. Theropod dinosaurs, two-legged dinosaurs, can be quite big, can be quite small, but... Clearly dinosaurs, they don't have feathers, uh, and the, the proto-feathers, well, they're not really proto-feathers, just, just, just decaying skin, fossilised, and it gives you an appearance which resembles, in a, a slight way, filaments and feathers. So dinosaurs, that seems pretty clear. On the other side, you've got birds, uh, things like uh, protoarchaeopteryx, cordyteryx, archaeopteryx, and uh, these uh, rather interesting tri uh, Triassic footprints, and these all seem to be bird fossils. And what have you got left? Well, you've got these creatures, especially this one, four-winged flying creature. Well, these are the flying raptors. 
So what I'm suggesting to you, actually, is you've got three groups of creatures, one of which doesn't fly, the dinosaurs, the theropod dinosaurs, but then you've got the flying raptors and the birds. So if we'd have been around at the time, we wouldn't have just seen birds flying through the sky, we would have also seen raptors flying through the sky, some of them even having four wings. And they have features which they share with birds, including the flow-through uh, breathing system and feathers. But they didn't have other features of birds. The birds have got other features which they didn't share with these flying uh, raptors. So, by way of conclusion, the evidence, the fossil record, reveals a variety of feathered birds and flying raptors with feathers and other bird-like features. But another very important point, the, the birds actually existed before their supposed theropod ancestors. There's no fossil theropod ancestor to the bird older than a bird. They're all younger. There's no evidence for the gradual evolution of feathers. And also, there's actually no fossil evidence for the gradual evolution of the bird lung system. And actually, I conclude that uh, the optimal design of birds is consistent with creation. The creation of birds as a fully functioning creature, uh, any creation of uh, raptors too flying with, with some of the features, of, as I've said, of birds. So there, I, I've come to the end of my talk. So open it up for questions. Uh, maybe uh, some detail you'd like to, to raise, question me about. As uh, Paul said, tonight's subject is the dino bird controversy. And my title is, Did Birds Evolve from Dinosaurs? And what we're going to do this evening is look at the actual evidence for the, uh, the, the statement that many people make, that the media will make, and many evolutionary scientists will make, that we have good evidence that birds evolve from dinosaurs. So we're going to look at that evidence. We're going to start looking at theropod dinosaurs. The supposed ancestors of birds are the theropod dinosaurs. So you're going to get a bit of a quick lesson in dinosaur limb. And then you've got the Sinornithosaurus, which means Chinese bird lizard. So these names are actually tell you quite a bit about the creature already. And this is a group that which are also uh, grouped together and called dromaeosaurs, or raptors. Raptors being much easier to say, named after the Velociraptor. So here's a picture of Velociraptor. And the, the, one of the interesting characteristics of these creatures, and these reconstructions actually uh, are rather debatable, but the important thing here is the large claw, which I've circled here, and that's the characteristic of this group, the large claw, which people think was used to attack and kill its prey, or maybe enabled it to climb trees. The Velociraptor is a, a classic uh, dromaeosaur or raptor. And then we have the meat, or it can be as small as a chicken. As some, some dinosaurs, actually the average size of dinosaurs is actually quite small, and not as big as people uh, often assume. So what do they... How can we classify dinosaurs? Well, there, there are two main groups of dinosaurs. There's the Ornithischia, and if you're an ornithologist, you will know that Ornithischia, orni, is bird. Well, actually, the birds didn't descend from these ones, even for an evolutionist. They just happen to have hips that look like bird hips, but they're not at all like birds. And then there are the, the Saurischia, Saurischia, Lizard-like hips. So you've got dinosaurs with bird-like hips and dinosaurs with lizard-like hips. And in the, in the second group, we have nomenclature and some badly pronounced dinosaur names in very bad Latin. And I struggle very much with the, with the names, but uh, hopefully it won't be too confusing. We're going to look at some of the fossils that really have sparked the recent debate in whether we can actually claim, or some people can claim, that uh, birds evolved from dinosaurs. But we're also going to look at the design of birds and see whether the evolutionary explanation is adequate to explain what we actually observe in birds today. And we're going to look particularly at feathers, and we're going to look at how the lungs of birds operate. So, theropod dinosaurs. What are theropod dinosaurs? Well, here is a picture of a theropod dinosaur, uh, Tyrannosaurus rex. A theropod dinosaur is basically any dinosaur that walks around on two legs. So it can be as big as Tyrannosaurus rex, seven tons 
of uh, angry. The theropods, two-legged dinosaurs, and the sauropods. The sauropods are the large four-legged dinosaurs. Got Tyrannosaurus and the Celurosaurs under the, th the theropod group, and you have things like the Brachiosaurs, which are the large um, Apatosaurus, the sort of really huge uh, dinosaurs. There's one in, um, in the British the Natural History Museum in London. But the dinosaurs that interest are, us are the group under the Celurosaurs, and you've got th animals like the Velociraptor, which was made famous by a certain Hollywood movie I won't mention. You've got the Nonicus. You've got the uh, animals called uh, Sinosauroteryx, and if you're uh, an expert in Latin, you will know that means Chinese lizard wing. 